So migration is important in the millennial age. And there are issues that come on the back of that. And I think it's millennials that will make the big changes to things like social cohesion. That's not just about money gaps, it's about technology gaps. 41% of the globe today has access to the internet on a regular basis. And that's pretty cool when you think that 25 years ago we didn't have a publicly uh, accessible internet. 41%, but it still means that 59% don't have access to the advantages of the cloud. By 2025, 50% of the world will have a smartphone, according to the UN. That's exciting when you think that 2007 saw the first iPhone. It's remarkable, really. But it still means that 50% won't have it, that advantage. That's why in London recently, or a couple of years ago, millennials formed a group called Stop the Cyborgs. Anybody heard of this? Stop the Cyborgs is a group that was set up to campaign effectively for a change in the way people access Google Glass. But it's now gone beyond Google Glass to other technologies. Their point is that we shouldn't have a high price tag on these technologies because it only allows certain individuals to have a massive advantage over everybody else in the population. Here in Germany, of course, you also have economic underclasses emerging that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. A report not too long ago pointed out that in your country there's an emerging underclass of highly industrialized workers, highly trained, who sit at home today because they've been globalized out of a job, watching television, and according to this report, drinking more than anybody else does in terms of units of alcohol per person, and having no interest in further training. So these are issues that I believe, because of their collaborative nature, millennials will want to bring innovation to. Much of that innovation will come through things like social enterprise. It's interesting for me to note that the term social enterprise didn't exist before millennials came on the scene. That says something to me about the millennial generation. Businesses set up to make a profit which solve a social problem. Their reason to exist is social problems. Social enterprise is adding $2 trillion to global revenue every year, and that number's going up every year or two now. I don't know if you've heard of M-Pesa. Has anybody heard of M-Pesa? Uh, I was just in South Africa again recently. I've been going there for 25 years to speak to different sectors of society and the media, and I always love the changes that I see there, even at the moment where there are real challenges going on. And M-Pesa is a great story. It, you know, in, in rural South Africa and Africa generally, there are many people, but not many banks. So two young, it's always young, young millennial entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, took some new school software, put it into old school phones, so that people in rural areas could do basic banking transactions with these old 15-year-old phones, in our view. It's what we used to use 15 years ago. And now 70% of all households in Kenya have at least one MPSA user. That's a remarkable success, driven by millennials, and I could tell you many stories like that. Citizen sourcing is another thing that millennials are driving in many parts of the world today. Citizen sourcing allows us to use digital information to map complex, messy areas. So a good example is the Kabira slum in Nairobi. It's the biggest in the world. One million people live in 550 acres. There's one toilet for every 50 shacks. But until recently, the government in Nairobi did not know how many toilets there were in that huge slum. They didn't know how many folk education areas were set up within that slum. They didn't know how many um, toilets there were. They didn't know how many traditional medical facilities were available. Until again, two millennial social enterprise leaders put some new software into some GPS units, trained the community leaders, the tribal leaders in this slum, to go and map their particular area of the slum. And as a result, the government now has a 3D digital map of all the areas of need within that community. Uh, and lobby groups, of course, are using that map to push the government into making change. These, again, are driven by millennials. Millennials are also a nurtured generation. Now, again, I'm not talking about you personally, if you're a millennial, but the generation you're part of is in terms of comparison with boomers and Generation X, much better nurtured. You've been more watched over than any generation in recent history. More cameras have watched you in the time that you were growing up. 
your time was more managed by others than any generation in recent times. I'm talking in the developed world. This is, a, in many ways, a very good thing. When you emerged, Toys R Us emerged, the whole factories of toys for you. Generation X didn't have that. When you emerged, Harry Potter came along, whole book industries for your benefit, whole gaming industries on the internet started up after you came along. This is all good. For some CEOs, when you ask them about millennials in the workspace, they see it as a not-so-positive thing because they say, I find them a little bit spoiled, a little bit emotionally brittle, and they need constant reinforcement. You know, they're, they're only interested in their generation and what their peers are doing. They're not interested in a multi-generational enterprise. I don't know if those things are true. I have three millennial adult children. I'm not so sure they are, but their perceptions in the workspace sometimes. What I do know is true from the research we've done is that millennials place a high premium on trust. They believe that if someone is given a job to do, they should be allowed to get on with it and not micromanaged, which of course is a problem in some areas of industry today. And because they put premium on trust, they're at the forefront of the search for the new ethic. If you go to universities to lecture, as I sometimes have the privilege of doing, you will note that it's young millennials who are asking the questions about global ethics. Ethics about the means versus ends. As we play with the gadgets, the phones, the tablets, do we have time to think about what we're producing, the ends? Uh, questions about the law of unintended consequences. Are we giving enough thought to the, present, to the future implications of, future, of present technologies? Are we just building faster machines to take us nowhere? They're asking questions about the line between humanity and technology as we invite technology into our bodies through biochips and memory upgrades over the next 10 years. Will we lose the line between man and machine? Is that line even important anymore? These are questions the millennials are asking. Millennials are asking the big ethics questions. They're driving the search for a new ethic in business today. You may not know this, but in the last 10 years, a number of significant universities throughout Europe, starting with the University of Birmingham in England, have set up for the first time faculties of global ethics. They didn't exist 12 years ago. Today they do. Why? In part because millennials are looking for answers to the ethical questions. It's millennials who have made pop culture heroes of academics like Professor Michael Sandel of Harvard University. If you haven't read his books, I encourage you to do so. Michael Sandel, Professor Deborah Satz of Stanford University. These are professional academic ethicists. Not in the past a particularly sexy op occupation. But millennials are listening to them, reading their books, watching them online, because they represent a new, or they talk about a new kind of capitalism. What they, some of you in Germany call a moral capitalism, some call a new capitalism. It's a, it's a, a, a market that uh, defines us, uh, serves us rather, and doesn't define us. And this is the language of these ethicists. Because it's a nurtured generation with a high premium on trust, I think in the next 10 years we're going to see millennials forming, uh, pushing for a totally different kind of leadership in politics, in civic leadership, and in business. Just this year, the Edelman Group, which is a large communications and marketing organization, published what they call the um, trust barometer for different countries of the world. And it was intriguing to me to watch what was happening in Germany in terms of trust in major institutions when it comes to what they call the informed public, the public who read the news and watch the news. If you look at the rate for NGOs between 15 and 16, the rate went up in the last year, non-government organizations, perhaps because of the refugee crisis, I don't know. Business went up slightly over the last year. The level of trust in business went up, but it must be noted that business started out with a very low figure to begin with. Just 45% of people said they trusted leaders of business. Media, similar numbers to business, again started from a low base. Government, for the first time in seven years, went down in Germany. The rate of trust, the level of public trust in government institutions went down, perhaps because of some of the refugee uh, overflow, the outflow from that, I don't know. The point is, trust is essential to all kinds of leadership. High trust equals capacity to act and bring change. If you don't have high trust, 
You can't bring change. I have a friend here today who works as a strategic advisor to one of the ministers of the German government, and Marcus will tell you that trust is absolutely key to leadership. I think it's going to be the millennials more than the Gen Xs or boomers who push to change levels of trust. The OECD last year said there are five areas in which trust is being punished or uh, it needs to be refocused on in leadership. One is tax. People are asking who pays tax, who should pay tax, who doesn't pay tax. Hence the big stories about Amazon and Google and so on at the moment. Migration, how many can we let in? What does it cost? That's an obvious one. Business, who makes public policy? Is it government or is it big business and lobby groups that make government policy? Climate change, who should be making the sacrifices to get a better deal for the climate? And the fifth one they said is science. Who should we believe? There are so many studies on so many things and they seem to say contradictory things at times. Who do we believe? These are all areas where the OECD said we need to readdress the area of trust. Being in South Africa a couple of weeks ago, I was reminded of the story of when Mandela first became president and how he befriended a group of young, mainly white athletes who played a sport, rugby, that he previously despised because it had been a symbol of apartheid. But he knew that if he was going to build his vision of the Rainbow Nation, he was going to need the support of these athletes, and more importantly, the millions of fans that they represented. And this, for me, was the magic of someone like Nelson Mandela and what sets him apart. He didn't come to the job seeing himself as the president of black South Africa. He would have been justified in doing so, perhaps. He didn't come to the job seeing himself as the president of what they used to call coloured South Africa. He came to the job seeing himself as the president of all South Africans. He was there for the common good. And I think it's millennials that will be pushing to see leadership that asks the question, what kind of city do I want to live in 10 years from now? What can I do now to set that in motion? Whereas at the moment, the measure of success in corporate life is how much can I make for the shareholders? I think this is an area where millennials will want to innovate. What kind of city do you want to live in 10 years from now? How can you, from your business base, build that and set that in motion? Finally, with the millennials, it's a narrative generation. McKinsey found three years ago in a global study that for most CEOs, the missing ingredient in the team, but the thing the team wants most from its leader, is meaning. Meaning in the work. I think the best motivation is work that matters. And I think millennials know that. In an age of disjointed data, people need a narrative into which to plug their lives. They need to know when they come to work, this is not just what our company produces, this is what we stand for beyond the shareholders' interest, beyond the corporate front door. The bottom line is just the bottom line. I think that millennials like Generation Edge are very much narrative in the way they think. Partly because almost every form of memorable information that comes to a millennial has a story somewhere attached to it. A song is often a story, a music clip of a song is often a different kind of story. Newscasts now are much more short stories than they ever were before. Even social media is a form of storytelling. Stream of consciousness, as it happens, this is my story, this is my personal brand, outworked before your eyes. These are narrative generations. And I think that we'll see millennials pushing to form a new kind of leadership that gives sight lines to individuals. Here's our big picture story, and here's how what you do at your workstation helps us achieve that goal.